my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place to come together and share childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from all over the world. This episode is sponsored by 8 Sheep Organics. Did you know that over 78% of pregnant moms have trouble sleeping at night? If you're lying awake in the middle of the night, tossing and turning, unable to sleep, then you should check out the Sleepy Lotion from 8 Sheep. It's a body lotion specially formulated to help pregnant moms sleep better. It also helps with common pregnancy pains like restless legs, leg cramps, and back and hip pain. Over 116,000 moms have used this lotion and rated it 4.8 stars. And it comes with a 60-day money-back guarantee. If you're not 100% satisfied, you can return the jar for a full refund. Go to 8sheep.com and use the code BIRTHHOUR for 10% off your purchase. I've used this lotion. It smells amazing. My mom actually stole my first jar and had to get another one. And I still use it even after having pregnancy way behind me at this point. And it's actually really great for my back pain at night. So I highly recommend it. It'll help you sleep and make you feel good. Again, that's 8sheep.com and use the code BIRTHHOUR for 10% off your purchase. All right. If you're a regular birth hour listener, you already know what I'm going to talk about next, but I like to always just remind people because we have new listeners all the time. And I want to share about our online childbirth course called Know Your Options. This course is an entirely online work at your own pace, lifetime access, evidence-based course featuring 12 modules covering everything from choosing a care provider to preparing for birth, whether that be induction, planned cesarean, birth center, home birth, unplanned cesarean. We cover it all so that you can choose where and how to give birth based on all of the most up-to-date evidence-based information available, coupled with learning to trust your instincts and be able to make decisions based on what is right for you. We all know birth is unpredictable from listening to this podcast podcast, and we want you to go into labor knowing your options and feeling prepared and empowered. I want to quickly share a post from one of our students in our Know Your Options private Facebook group that really illustrates exactly that. Okay, this is shared with permission from Corinne, and she posted in our group with pictures of her new sweet baby and says, I was planning on having a birth center birth, but was detoured to an emergency C-section due to a placenta abruption. Lucky this class prepared me for that exact scenario when a C-section was necessary, and I had a positive experience because of that. Very blessed. All right, so that really illustrates kind of the goal of this course for us. And we get messages like this all the time and comments on our Zoom calls that we do with our course students. And I should share them more often, but I'm just not as good about it as I should be. So anyways, this course was created five years ago and we're constantly updating it with the most evidence-based information. And when I say we, I really mean my partner on this course, Stephanie, who is a childbirth educator, lactation counselor, and doula with many, many years of experience attending births and teaching couples to prepare for birth. She's amazing. Her teaching style really just caught my attention when I attended one of her courses in person. And we dreamed up this idea to create this online format five years ago now. So we have many returning moms. We just had someone come on who is watching everything on her second pregnancy. And she's just like, this is amazing. I forgot so much. I can't believe how great of a job you guys did with this and how many things you forget after that first baby. So we love having first time moms and second, third, fourth, whatever it is. You can come back to this information time and time again, because once you sign up, you get lifetime access you guys so we would love to have you we have people on our zoom calls which are twice a month we have people on there who have been doing this since covid which it's crazy to say that it's been over two years now since we've um all been getting together every other week to chat about what's going on with us and so some of those people have babies are on their second baby trying to conceive again we really just support one another and all questions are welcome and everyone gives their own feedback and then stephanie and i chime in with our experience as well usually hers is you know based on the one-on-one experience she has supporting clients in birth. And then mine is often just my own experience or chiming in about things that I've heard time and time again on this podcast. So you guys know as a host of The Birth Hour, I really just try to listen and not give a bunch of feedback. But on these Zoom calls, it's a great opportunity to really chat and get to know one another. And the course is really designed to be taken with your partner. You don't have to sit and watch the course modules together, but I think it's a good idea if you are able to do that. But you can both access it on different computers if you need to. I know I've been saying moms a lot as far as the Zoom 
calls and those have tended to just be all moms on there. It's really just almost like an in-person meetup, which is amazing. But the course is really designed to be done with your partner and we hear over and over again how helpful it was for the partner, almost even more so than the birthing person. Okay, all of that information, I know that was a lot. You can get more information at thebirthhour.com slash course and you can still use that coupon code 100OFF for $100 off enrollment. Today's birth story guest is Hannah, and she was actually on the podcast. She shared on episode 524 her cesarean birth, and she's back to share her VBAC birth. So if you want to listen to that first episode, it's now in the archives via Patreon, which you can join for just $1 a month over at patreon.com slash birth hour. But today we're going to be hearing her VBAC story, which was a really redeeming experience for her. Also wanted to quickly note that the audio on this is a little bit off. I think there was something going on with her microphone. There's just like some little background noises and things like that. So just keep that in mind when you listen. This is not the audio that we usually hope for, but it's still a great story. So let's hear from Hannah. Hi, Hannah. Welcome back to the birth hour. Thanks for coming on the podcast today. Hi, Bryn. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here again. Awesome. Well, yeah, you were on the podcast back in 2020, episode 524. But will you just remind people a little bit about you and your family? Yes, I will. I am a emergency department nurse and my husband is in ag sales and we live in a small town in Oregon. And I think during my first pregnancy, we were in our first house. So we have a new house, which is actually a really old house, but we bought a new house a year ago and we have our daughter, Rosemary, who is two and uh, a dog named Harold. And then we have our new son named Peter, who is six weeks old. Okay. So we're going to be hearing his birth story today. Anyone can go back and listen to that other episode that was a cesarean birth for breech baby and a couple other things that came up. But let's start with your second pregnancy and anything you want to share about getting pregnant, finding out you're pregnant, that sort of thing. Yeah. So we decided after my daughter was born, I feel like around three months, I was already just like craving being pregnant again for some reason. I think a lot of it had to do with her birth and the way it went. It was very unexpected and it was not what I planned. And so I kind of wanted to get pregnant again. And we decided to start trying right when she turned one. And we got pregnant on our first try with her. We were really lucky. So I had kind of thought like maybe we would get pregnant easy on the second try as well, which we did. It was, I think, month four. And so you know, at the time, of course, it felt like that was so long. I was tracking my ovulation and I was kind of becoming obsessive and trying to look at all the signs. And I thought about doing basal body temperature and I just got really invested in it, but it it was really only four months, which wasn't hard at all. So we got pregnant at our fourth month of trying and my pregnancy was pretty good, very similar to my first pregnancy no real complications, you know, no gestational diabetes or hypertension or anything. The only thing I can think of that came was I had some anxiety around getting to 36, 37 weeks because I was really nervous about uh, potentially my son being breech because my daughter was breech and I didn't know why she was positioned that way. I know it can just be kind of random depending on the baby or depending on the person who's pregnant, but I was really nervous that we would get to the end and they would say, oh, sorry, you know, he's breech. We're going to have to do a cesarean or something. So my main goal through this pregnancy was to, you know, obviously to have a healthy baby, but to focus my efforts on making sure he was head down and preparing myself for a vaginal birth after cesarean. So I talked with my OB a lot about that and he was on board. He said that I would be a great candidate and he said that we would just kind of take it one step at a time. And yeah, the only other kind of complication, which was really minor, is I developed this rash called Puffs Rash. And I had only heard of it because of this podcast, actually. And I remember hearing about it, I think maybe a year or so ago on one of the episodes and thinking like, oh, that sucks to have like an itchy rash on top of being pregnant. And then around 30 six weeks, maybe I started to realize that my belly was itchy and it was all below my belly button, which 
I was like, oh, you know, I've been in the sun a lot. Maybe I sunburnt my belly and it's just itching because it's dry. And then as time went on, the weeks went on, I was just like, it is still so itchy. What is going on? And I started to notice a rash and the rash is so specific because it develops like in your stretch marks. So if you have any stretch marks, the rash just lines your stretch marks and it makes you (laughs) itch your skin off. It's terrible. So I went to, I think my 36 week appointment or something and said, I have got to have you check this. I don't know what it is, but I'm itching like crazy. And my OB took one look at it and he was like, oh yeah, that's pup's rash. I can't remember what it stands for. And I was like, what do I do? And basically he said, you can use topical steroids, but like there's really nothing you can do. And for some women, it spreads down their legs and it gets horrible. And he said some women will even like opt to be induced because they can't handle it. Because once you deliver it, it takes like a week, but it goes away. So that was the main thing. Maybe some swollen feet, but that pups rash was miserable. Yeah. I've heard from a lot of people how tough that is. And really there's not much you can do about it other than it goes away when the baby arrives, right? Yeah. I mean, I, there's so much going on when the baby arrives that you, you kind of don't even really notice it. Yeah. (laughs) But I was like a few days later, I was like, oh my gosh, thank you. It's gone. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. All right. Well, anything else from pregnancy you want to share about? I just think that my main focus was I would listen to this podcast and kind of just almost do my own meditation on kind of preparing this next birth and preparing for VBAC, which I knew I'd have to advocate for. But, you know, there wasn't really anything else to my pregnancy. It was pretty, pretty basic. All right. So you talked about, you know, finding the doctor that was going to be um, supportive of a VBAC and that sort of thing. Did you do anything else to prepare in that sense? So I uh, listened to your podcast religiously and (laughs) I was obviously very invested in any of the stories that included VBAC in their title. Uh, But I also talked with a lot of people and I even joined, I joined, there's a Facebook group for everything and I joined a VBAC Facebook group, although I didn't spend as much time on there as I thought that I would. And I don't know if that was just... um, Like I just didn't really like dedicate the time to it, but I did join that group and I would see some updates or, you know, kind of go on every now and then. But another thing I would say is really just like talking to people and asking their stories and kind of some self meditation and just, you know, discussing things with my OB and talking with my friends who had had babies and really playing out the logistics and thinking about the risks And just, I basically was like, I'm going to speak this into existence. There's no reason why I shouldn't be able to have one. And my OB agrees and all my friends agreed. My mom had two VBACs. I was a VBAC baby. And so I really just am kind of a mental uh, person. And so a lot of what I do or set my mind to comes with me thinking heavily about it all the time. So I think that was the main thing that I did. All right. Well, do you want to go ahead and talk about how labor started for you? Yeah. So really quickly, my daughter was seven pounds, 10 ounces, born three weeks early. So she was technically large for gestational age. And so we had known leading up to my birth with my son, like, okay, he's probably going to be a big baby. And that was one of the potential complications of a VBAC was just like, well, is he going to be really big? Is that going to cause any issues? I had talked extensively with my OB about what's the likelihood that if I go post dates, they're going to worry, okay, your post dates, you have a big baby. We're not going to induce you because you're a VBAC. We're going to jump straight to an elective cesarean. So it just kind of threw another twist on things that made me worried of the potential of having to have another C-section or not being able to um, have the chance to labor. So I did do a growth scan as well as a positioning ultrasound to just make sure that my son was head down at 36 weeks. And he was, he was head down. And I remember, I think at 36 weeks, he was already measuring like seven and a half pounds. 
And I was just like, oh no, here we go. Um, but I just thought, you know what? It is what it is. I'm going to birth this baby one way or another. Even if he's big, he's got to come out. It's not like that's going to stop me. So I tried to mentally tell myself my goal would be to deliver in the 38th or 39th week. Now, of course, you can't do anything to make that happen necessarily. The baby's going to come whenever they want. But I, you know, as I got closer, I was like, it would be kind of ideal for him to come at that time. That way he's not huge. And that way I'm not overdue and worried about an induction because I think the only two methods that I was allowed for induction as a VBAC was either Pitocin, which I didn't really want because my goal was to go unmedicated. And I knew as soon as I invited Pitocin into the story, that would be probably more difficult from what I've heard. And then my other option would be a fully bulb, which is the bulb that they stick up, I think, into your cervix. I don't exactly know. And then when you dilate to a certain centimeter, like three or four, it's supposed to fall out. But I was about one centimeter dilated at 36 weeks. So I thought, well, you know, I might already be three centimeters by the time I'm overdue. And I don't think that they'll be able to do the Foley bulb if I'm already dilated to a three. So I really wanted to try to deliver before my due date if I could. So I decided around, I think I was 38 weeks and five days. I went in for an appointment and I talked to my OB. And so I thought, oh, maybe I could get my membrane stripped. And he thought that that was a great idea. He was like, after 38 weeks, you know, if you kind of want to kickstart labor, if your body's ready, I think getting your membrane stripped is a great idea. And I didn't know if it was like the perfect time because my daughter who was, you know, almost two at the time was really sick and going through this really clingy stage. She had had a fever for five days. I I think she just had a virus, but she was pretty sick, pretty whiny, pretty fussy. And I thought, what a not ideal time to go into labor and have her go to my parents' house for a few days and like bring a newborn baby home. And, but then my, my OB brought something up at my appointment about how He said, you know, in the next two weeks, there's a potential we'll be adopting a rule that states that all VBAC or TOLAC trial of labor after cesarean candidates are not going to be able to be induced if they go post-date. They will just have to have an election C-section, which I thought was kind of weird. And I thought, okay, well, my whole entire pregnancy, I've been planning for a VBAC. I don't want, you know, in the next two weeks for this rule to become an issue to where I'm going to have to have a C-section if I go over. And I didn't know if that would exactly apply to me. I didn't know the details. He was kind of vague, but I thought, all right, let's just strip my membranes and see if it'll get things going. So he did the membrane sweep and it was pretty uncomfortable. Of course, now going through labor, I look back and I'm like, that wasn't uncomfortable. That was nothing. But when he pulled his fingers out, he basically said, Hey, there's blood on my glove. I could feel your membrane separating. This is a good sweep. Like hopefully this will kickstart labor if your body's ready. And I was like, okay. So I went home and that was a Friday. And I think I just kind of went about my day and I think I had some maybe light, light spotting and a tiny bit of cramping, which I had heard was normal. And then he gave me, he said like about 48 hours would be when you would kind of go into labor if the membrane sweep was going to help. And so I just thought, we'll see. Then Saturday night, I think I started to have some random contractions while I was sleeping. When I would get up to go pee, which was every couple of hours, I could feel a little bit of discomfort. But I had never felt a contraction with my daughter because I never went into labor with her. So I didn't know for sure if they were contractions, they weren't regular, they weren't lasting a certain amount of time. They were just super random discomfort. So I was like, I don't know. But then that dwindled off throughout the day. Sunday night, I had a little bit more regular feeling contractions, but they still weren't very painful. I would say I would have one every like 
half an hour or hour. It was hard to tell because it was the middle of the night. And so I was sleeping and I would kind of wake up a little bit and then fall back asleep and kind of wake up a little bit. So those carried on kind of through Sunday morning. I took my daughter blueberry picking and they just dwindled off and I didn't think much about it. Oh, wait, I think I just got a little bit turned around. Saturday night, I had contractions and they picked up Sunday night and they went on through Monday morning. And then throughout the day on Monday, I had a contraction, maybe one every two hours. I had a friend who came over and brought me some newborn diapers because I needed to stock up on those, which little did I know, my son would never actually wear newborn diapers because he was way too big. But uh, she brought over some coffee. She brought over her kids and we kind of had a play date and just were hanging out. And I think I had like two contractions while she was here. And she is a friend of mine who I really like lean on and use as a resource as far as like pregnancy and birth and motherhood. And she's had two unmedicated births. And so when I had my contractions, I didn't even know if that's what they were. And I was just like, do you think I'm, do you think I'm having contractions? Like, what are these things? And, you know, of course she's like, I don't know. They're different for everyone. But as the day went on, they kind of started to pick up. My mom then came over. She was helping me kind of get the nursery ready because the nursery had previously been my husband's office. He works from home. And so at the last minute was like, okay, you've got to find a new office out in the garage because we need to get the nursery ready. Not that, I mean, I know that they don't really use the, the crib or the nursery that early, but I wanted to have like a space for his clothes and a spot where I could pump and just kind of have that space ready for him so that things weren't everywhere. So my mom was over and she was helping me do some last minute cleaning. She was, I was telling her to do random things, which this should have kind of been a sign because I was telling her to deep clean the dryer and the washing machine because they were like dusty. And I was having her spray down our um, window screens and mop the floors and like dust the lamps and just kind of some deep cleaning, which I had been nesting for the past few weeks, but it really picked up. And the whole day I was just kind of irritable, which I had kind of been irritable the entire weekend. I mean, my belly was itchy. I was really pregnant. My daughter was just whiny and I was just tired. And so I should have known. And it's so funny because every time I've listened to a, a story on this podcast, I think, oh, of course that woman's in labor. Like how funny that she didn't know that. But then when it's yourself, you're just like, I don't know, am I in labor? Like, how do I know? So (laughs) yeah, totally. (laughs) Yeah. I just was like, of course I'm going to know. And then I was like, wow, I'm so disappointed in myself. I have no idea what this is. (laughs) But I guess my fear was that I was in prodromal labor, like it was going to be false labor and I wouldn't be progressing and I would go in and get checked and they would send me home. And I just, it all spiraled every time I thought about it. So when I had been recently checked at my 38 week appointment, I was, I think one centimeter dilated, like 80% effaced. And I can't remember what station I was, maybe negative two. And so, uh, I kept talking with my mom about how I was having these, you know, feelings that felt like contractions, but I didn't know what they were. And she could tell because as the day went on, maybe, you know, into the late afternoon, she was like, let's go for a walk and just try and get your mind off it. We'll take Rosemary, which is my daughter, to the park so she can get outside. And mind you, at this time, not that Oregon gets that hot, but this was like the hottest part of the summer. It was like a hundred degrees. And so I don't know why it was a good idea, but we went out and went for a walk and we walked down to the park and I had to stop every like five to seven minutes and not necessarily breathe through the contractions, but like stop and focus. And my mom was like, I'm going to start timing these. And I'm like, mom, no, don't time these. That's stupid. I'm not in labor. Like, don't make this a big deal. And she's like, okay, okay, fine. I won't time them. But then I could see her like secretly every time I, I stopped walking, start her her watch. And I was like, mom, I know you're timing these. So she started timing them and, um, we went to the park and then walked back and they were coming every five to 10 minutes. And she said, you know, I think, I mean, you've been having them every five to 10 minutes for a couple, you know, two hours now. 
And she's like, you should go take a shower. So I went, took a shower. And I remember hearing that if your contractions keep going while you are in the shower or once you get out, like then it's probably not false labor. So I had a contraction in the shower. I had a contraction when I got out of the shower. And I thought, okay, you know, maybe I am in labor, but still it could be false labor. I don't want to get my hopes up. So she had told my husband, Hey, maybe you should go into town, take Rosemary with you, get some dinner and then, you know, come back. So Hannah can rest because my daughter wanted to be like all over me. And I was not able to really do that while I was in labor. So my husband left and then my mom was like, let's put on a show and try to distract you. So we're trying to watch the show and every few minutes I'm getting up and I'm really emotional at this point. And a lot of it was the emotion behind not being able to be there for my daughter because all day she had wanted me to spend time with her. And it was really hard when I was having contractions and just feeling so miserable. And so I was just emotional with each contraction. I would like start crying or I would just walk away so that my mom couldn't see me. So she called my husband and said, I think you need to come home and take Hannah to the hospital. I think it's time to go. And I was like, no, mom, don't. This is stupid. Don't have him come home. You're making a big deal. I'm not in labor. I'm going to go in. I'm only going to be one centimeter dilated. And she was like, Hannah, I have had five babies. You are in labor. She's like, I'm going to smack you. So uh, my husband came home and we packed up our stuff and we started driving. And I thought, well, and I said to him, I was like, I'm so sorry if this is not labor. I'm going to feel so stupid if we have to come back home. We were about a 35 minute drive from the hospital. And so I didn't want to do that for nothing. But also, had I waited any longer, that drive would have been miserable. So I did have multiple contractions on the way to the hospital where I had to unbuckle my seatbelt and grab the handle on the ceiling and just really like brace myself and kind of breathe through the contractions. And so we get to the hospital and this is the hospital I work at. So, and it was probably like 7 PM and I was like, okay, I don't want anyone in my, like any of my coworkers to see me because that's going to be so embarrassing if they see me. And I think I'm in labor and I'm not. So uh, we bypassed the emergency department really quickly and we went to check in and the lady at the front desk was like, okay, so what are you here for? And I was like, oh, I'm here to go to labor and delivery. And she was like, oh, okay, are you visiting someone who had a baby? And I'm like, I'm having a baby. I'm in labor. Like I looked at my husband and I'm like, she doesn't even think I'm in labor. Like this is so stupid. (laughs) So it just kind of was a mess. And I was just in such denial. But she eventually just said, you can just walk over to labor and delivery. And so we went over there and I got checked into triage and the nurse hooked me up on the monitor and I had a contraction and I was like, okay, can you tell me, was that a contraction? And she looked at the monitor and she's like, yeah, that was absolutely a contraction. And I'm like, so I'm not just like making this up. Like I'm having contractions, right? And she was like, yes, you're having contractions. And then she checked me and she was like, oh, you're four centimeters. And I was like, oh my gosh, I am so happy. I started crying. I high fived my husband and I was like, we're doing this. Like I'm in labor. This is great news. So we, you know, texted my family, gave them a quick update. And so then at this point, she was like, okay, we're going to get you admitted. And the doctor who was uh, delivered my daughter actually via cesarean was on call that night. So I was like, this is perfect. She wasn't my OB, but I knew her and she was really a great doctor. And so I was like, this is awesome. So um, they got my IV started because since I was a VBAC, even though I was wanting to go unmedicated, they were like, we have to put in an IV because if there's any sign of uterine rupture, you're going straight to the OR. And they had kind of warned me previously, like, just so you know, if you decide to go without an epidural and we see signs of uterine rupture, we won't have time to do an epidural or a spinal. So we're just going to have to put you under general anesthesia. And I was like, you know, that's fine because honestly, the chances of uterine rupture for me are like 1%. And I don't want that to scare me into getting an epidural if that's not what I wanted. And if it comes to it and I have to go under anesthesia, that's just what we'll do, I guess. Uh, Because at that point, (laughs) my birth plan is out the window anyway. So they did my IV. They took me over to my room and... Um, I met my nurse and she was really sweet and she did the whole check-in, which took a little while. So she had asked me like, what's your plan for pain management? And, um, I said, you know, I, I'm trying to go unmedicated. Um, I didn't want to sound like 
snobby at all, I guess. Like, I don't know if that makes sense, but I didn't want to come off as though I'm better than anyone because I don't want pain medication. I was just like, this is what I am wanting to try for my own reasons. And so I will let you know if I need any sort of coping, you know, like pain medication or an epidural. And she said, okay, that's fine. And uh, one thing that I really appreciated is no one said anything to me the entire labor about pain medication or an epidural. No one ever once brought it up or suggested it or asked if I wanted it, which I think was really helpful for me because I didn't even think about it then. But yeah, she asked me about that and then um, asked about my birth plan. And I just, you know, kind of talked with her about some stuff. And then she had left at that point. And my biggest, um, I don't know if I would call it a relief, but the biggest resource to me during labor was the birth ball. I would sit on it and I would kind of bounce, but more so I would roll my hips forward. I would have my legs like spread out wide. And during each contraction, I would just roll my hips forward and back and forward and back. And when I would roll them forward, I would try to just like kind of imagine bringing the baby down and like opening up and just like kind of pushing through that position, if that makes sense. And that is what I did a lot of as well as I would walk around the nurse's station and then I would lean over on the railing anytime I had a contraction and just kind of like moan through it. Because at this point I was kind of having some like low moans each time I would contract. And I started to notice my husband like falling asleep in the chair and I was like, just go to bed. You are not going to make it all night. There's no way I can expect you to stay awake all night because I know you and you fall asleep so easily. And I don't really... I didn't really want him awake just staring at me while I was having contractions. And I kind of knew I would be this way, but I was very internal during labor. So each contraction was just me and the birth ball working through it. I didn't want anyone else's help. And so even though it was kind of lonely since it was like at night and it was just me in the room and my husband was asleep, it was kind of what I needed to just focus and get through the first part of labor. And so... My nurse came in and checked me. I think it was 1130 because she said they do checks about every four hours. And I was only a four and a half. So I was pretty bummed. I mean, not super bummed, but I was kind of like, okay, that took a lot longer than I thought to get to a half centimeter more. Um, But I was just like, it was still manageable at this point. So I was like, that's fine. I'll just keep doing what I'm doing. I found a playlist. I just literally went onto Pandora and typed in calm, peaceful birth or something. And a random playlist came up and that playlist was gold. I listened to it the entire night into the morning. The only time I didn't listen to it was when I was pushing because I think my phone like died or something and I didn't notice anything when I was pushing. So I, I mean, I took it into the bathroom with me when I had to go to the bathroom. I did everything. Like I loved that. So the birth ball, the playlist, and then also um, essential oils, which I didn't know that I would be super into because I'm not really an essential oils person. But my night shift nurse came in and was like, hey, I have some lavender who that's supposed to like help or promote relaxation. And I have some bergamot that's supposed to help with pain. And she just put it on a cotton swab and a little baggie for me. And I would just smell those during each contraction and breathe through them. And it was wonderful. So I had gotten to a four and a half. And then I want to say three hours later, the doctor came in uh, to you know do her rounds and just say hi to me and check on me. And she checked me and she was like, oh, honey, you're a seven. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm already a seven. This is great. This is what I needed to get me through the rest of the night because I was falling asleep in between each, each contraction and desperately wanting rest and desperately wanting to lay down. It wasn't even necessarily pain relief that I was wanting at that point. I just wanted to lay down and like sleep, but my contractions were every three minutes. So I didn't have the opportunity to sleep. I also couldn't lay down for the life of me. I was so active during my labor that I just, I had to be up walking, moving, swaying, bouncing, just anything. So she checked me and I was like, okay, I'm a seven. This is great. I think my husband kind of woke up and I was like, I'm already a seven. And he probably was just like, yay. And then fell back asleep um, at this point. But the doctor also wanted to tell me about some sort of antibody, which I feel like since I'm a nurse, I should, I should really know this more than I do. 
But my baby was Coombs positive, which is some antibody situation that may cause issues with my future pregnancy. But in the moment, the main concern was potentially my baby needing a blood transfusion or potentially him having increased jaundice levels. But that was kind of like a, we'll have to wait till delivery and see. But she just wanted to give me that piece of information. And so I was like, I don't really know what that means, but I'm glad you told me. We'll talk about it more when I'm not in labor. So uh, the night went on and I did what I had been doing. I was on the birth ball, listening to my music, smelling my essential oils. And uh, my nurse would come in every now and then and chat with me. And she was really sweet and supportive. We tried the bathtub and I was shocked, but I did not like the bathtub at all. And I always pictured that I would just labor in the tub the entire time. But I think the reason I didn't like it was partially because I had pups rash I would lay in the tub and the water, every time I would move, would like go up and over my belly and it was really warm and it would like stimulate my rash and it made me so itchy. And then I had the monitors on because I was a VBAC. I had to be monitored all the time, even with wireless monitoring. So I was just so itchy and like wet. And I also really had to be moving during my contractions and the tub wasn't very big. So I felt confined to that area and that position. So she actually came in and was like, Hey, I'm going to have to have you get out of the tub because your baby's just not really handling it well. And I was like, that's fine. Cause I kind of hate this. So I got out and she hooked up some fluids at that point. Cause I think maybe his like heart rate dropped a little bit or something, but she just hooked up some basic fluids to my IV, which was fine. And then I just continued on with my labor. She then checked me at I think 6 a.m. at this point because I really, she wanted to know where I was at before her shift ended at 7 a.m. And I thought I was maybe going to have the baby on her shift. And everybody kind of thought that because I was already a seven at 2.30. But I was only an eight at 6 a.m. when she checked me. So I had only went one centimeter and I was like, dang it. So, um, at that point she was like, your water's bulging. We could totally break it if you want to. And I thought I'm trying to do this unmedicated. I'm worried that if I make the decision to have my waters broke, it's going to speed things up, but it's going to make it like not manageable for me. And I just don't want to do anything to jeopardize and then, you know, cause any sort of cascade of interventions. I just didn't want to make that decision. I wanted my water to break on its own. So that was at 6 a.m. But then I continued to labor. And at 9 a.m., I was like, okay, it's been three hours. They're not going to check me again until probably 10 because that would be the four-hour mark. Or basically at this point, they probably won't check me until I start feeling like I need to push or if something's wrong with the baby. And mentally, I was exhausted from being up all night. And I thought, I'm going to end up needing something if I have to keep going and don't know how many centimeters I'm at. So I, at 9am was just like, can you guys check me and just tell me where I'm at? And so, and if I'm still at an eight, just break my water because I don't, I don't think I can do this that much longer. And at that point she had the day shift doctor come on and check me. She was like, he needs to do his rounds anyways. And if we're going to break your water, he should just be the one to check you. So he came in, he was like this little gray haired man. He was so sweet, so jolly, the perfect person to see in the morning when I was just exhausted and needed some energy. So he came in and checked me and he was like, you're still an eight, but I can feel your water right there. And I was like, just pop it. So he popped it and it was a huge warm gush. And he was like, your membranes were just super thick. Like, I don't think that they would have ruptured for a while on their own, which obviously is providing cushion between your cervix and your baby's head. So that's probably why you're kind of stuck at an eight. And so I had maybe two more contractions after that, that were just like the normal ones I had been having. And then from that point on, they were so intense. They really picked up and I could really just feel his head engaging with everything down there. And at that point, my coping mechanisms were just being very, very vocal. I mean, I couldn't do the essential oils. I was on the bed because he had checked me and I couldn't get off the bed to sit back on the birth ball. I was having contractions so quickly and back to back. And some of them, I felt like they were going away. And then 
they would just peak again and they were like double peaking or they were lasting extra long. And I was like, I can't even get off the bed to get on the birth ball at this point. So I was sitting on the edge of the bed because I was trying to get up and I just told my nurse, I was like, I have to push. I don't even know if this is what pushing, like having to push feels like, but I have to do something because I am in just so much pain right now and I I need to cope with it somehow. And she was like, okay, well, if you're going to push, this is probably like 20 minutes after he broke my water. So she's like, if you're going to push, you need to lay back down so I can check you and make sure you've dilated fully. And I was like, I can't lay back down. And she's like, you have to, you're on the edge of the bed. I don't want you to fall off and I can't check you like this. And so I leaned back finally onto the bed and was able to lay down so that she could, my nurse could check me. And when uh, she checked me, she said, okay, so you're a nine and a half, but you have a cervical lip. And so I was kind of assuming at that point, what she meant was basically you can't push yet because you have still part of your cervix in the way. And I was like, I have to push. I mean, I feel so much pressure down there. I have no option at this point. And so she, at that point, also started to notice that I was having like a little bit of bleeding it was. And she was kind of nervous because she had said, you know, with VBAC, with VBAC candidates, we don't like to see any bleeding. And so she paged the doctor in and he came and he kind of assessed the situation and was like, okay, everything seems fine. Baby seems fine. We'll just keep monitoring. And he checked me and was like, okay, I'm going to push this lip out of the way. So during contraction, he pushed the cervical lip out of the way, which was super uncomfortable. And then at that point it was like, okay, you're, you're ready to push. So he walked out of the room, probably just assuming that since I've never gone through labor, pushed a baby out before it would be a while, which it, it did. I pushed for an hour and a half total. But at that point, when I saw him leave, I knew that that meant that I wasn't very close to delivering. And I was just like, no, come back. I have to get this baby out. So the first hour of me pushing was really me figuring out what the heck I was doing. Like I had no idea. So I had my husband on the left side of me and he was holding my left leg. And then I had my nurse on the right side of me. And I didn't really think that I would want to push on my back, but I didn't really have a choice because I was kind of stuck in that position. I was just so painful and I was just had no energy to move. And so I just learned how to push as best as I could. I was listening to my nurse. She at one point was sitting down on the edge of the bed and had her left arm pushing my leg up and then her right hand just basically in my vagina showing me like, this is where you need to push. These muscles are the muscles that you need to use. And as much as that was painful and uncomfortable, it was really helpful because everybody says that, oh, you just push like you need to poop. And I'm like, it's just not that simple, especially, I mean, my son was nine pounds, 14 ounces. And I was like, when has anyone ever pushed a 10 pound baby or a 10 pound poop out of their vagina? Like that's that I'm not just pushing. Like I need to poop. I need to push a specific way. So she was working with me a lot on figuring out how to use the correct muscles and bring him down under the pubic bone, but it just wasn't working. I was getting so exhausted. I was every contraction I had, I was just consumed by intensity and discomfort. And I was just felt like I was going to puke. I felt like I was going to pass out. I was at one point just like, this is just like too much. I can't handle this. I I can't push. This baby is going to stay in me forever. And I'm just going to die like this. Like, I mean, I didn't say that out loud, but in my mind, like I was kind of spiraling, not spiraling, but just going to a place where I was like, I don't know if I can do this. This is exhausting and I need to get this baby out. And so Basically, the doctor came in at that point because there was more bleeding. And he looked and said, oh, yeah, you have a vaginal septum that is blocking your baby's head like a seatbelt and not allowing him to descend properly. And I'm like, I don't even know what that means, but just get it out of the way so I can have this baby. So he cut the septum out of the way, which had they known prior to me delivering that I had this vaginal septum, they would have removed it, but they didn't know apparently until I was pushing my baby out. So he snipped it 
And that sped things up so much more. And we realized at the time, or maybe this was once the baby was out, but he had realized that the blood was all coming from the inside of my vagina, like the walls of the vagina, because when my baby was trying to come out, the strap was across his head and it was tearing away from the walls. So it was just not really a great situation. Um, but I pushed him out within like, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes after he cut the septum. And I told them while he was crowning kind of while there was the ring of fire, I said, I can feel everything tearing. Like I just feel so much tearing down there. And they were like, no, like we don't really see any, anything tearing that badly. But once they came out and he like plopped him, they plopped him up onto me, they started to notice all the bleeding and started to look inside and they were like, oh, that's where the tearing is coming from. So they were quickly trying to hold pressure because there was a lot of bleeding and trying to find all the tears and trying to do the repairs. But the issue was that it was bleeding so quick and the tears were so strange um, and at such weird angles that they were having a hard time finding you know, the best way to repair them. So I'm laying there and I have my baby on top of me, which was the greatest feeling ever because I did not get that with my daughter. I did not get the golden hour. I didn't even get her on my chest at a C-section and then she had to be put on, you know, the breathing machine for a little bit. So that was truly the greatest moment to feel him just all squishy and slimy and screaming, laying on top of me and just knowing like, okay, A, I did it. I did what I said I was going to do, what I've been planning on doing for years. And B, wow, I'm just glad that that's done because that was really hard. So meanwhile, they are trying to repair me, which was very excruciating. I didn't have any medication on board at this point and I was just so uncomfortable. The doctor was up there holding pressure, trying to stitch, trying to numb. And he was like, look, we're going to have to go to the OR. I'm going to have to put you, like consciously sedate you so that I can repair this because I need lights. I need different tools. Like I can't see what I'm doing. And I was like, no, I don't, I don't want to go to the OR. I don't want to be sedated. I uh, just worked my butt off for, you know, 18 plus hours to have this baby. I, I don't want to be unconscious and not get to hold him and be with him. And so the trade-off was they gave me a dose of IV fentanyl to do the repair, which, you know, as a nurse, my patients have always kind of said that IV fentanyl doesn't work the greatest. And I was always like, oh, you know, who really knows? But now I'm like, yeah, I mean, it it makes you not care about the pain, but it doesn't really take a whole lot of the pain away. So the repairing process was excruciating. It was not something that I ever want to go through again, but they did get the repair done. They did some vaginal packing to help with the bleeding. And then I was on the labor and delivery floor for a couple of hours, I think, because they had to give me like two bags of TXA, which is something to help uh, clot your blood so that your the bleeding slows down. And they didn't want to send me to the mother baby floor until the bleeding was under control. So they gave me some of that and they eventually had to take the packing out six hours after they put it in. So that was on the postpartum floor. And that in itself was not fun either, having that all pulled out after everything had kind of settled. And so, yeah, it was just kind of a, a crazy, crazy delivery. And When I talked with the doctor who delivered later on, he just said like, yeah, like I am so sorry about your parts down there. I can't believe that's the the weirdest thing that I've come across in a long time is someone having a vaginal septum that high up that hasn't been acknowledged before. And he said, your tearing was very abnormal. And I had a second degree external tear, but it was like the inside that was kind of all weird. And he basically just said like, it's, it's going to, take you a while to recover from this, but you know, like props to you for making it through, I guess. So that was that helpful to hear or frustrating or what? Um, it was kind of, this doctor was so sweet. It was nice to hear. Mm -hmm. He was so supportive and encouraging. It was just like, you did amazing. Like 
you're clinically yeah. insane because I can't believe that you're even smiling after you just went through all that. <laughs> I mean, he, he made me feel really good. Like he kind of gave the vibe of like, you're a rock star, like good for you. And so mm-hmm. it was frustrating to hear that I had this thing, this complication that we couldn't prepare for because no one knew about, but like, I don't, it's nobody's fault. Like how would anybody have known I had that septum up there? So, right. yeah, I mean, it was, yeah, it was fine. <laughs> Okay. (laughs) All right. So what about recovery? Um, I'll just touch on this quickly, but you know, recovery was very different from my C-section. I thought that it would be easier for some reason than a C-section because I had seen my friends who had given birth, you know, two days later be bouncing around and like totally fine. And not that everybody's like that. Obviously everybody's very different, but I've just, I had seen that before. And so I was like, oh, maybe, you know, if you don't have like a C-section, it's easier or something. And that was not the case at all. They were both very difficult in their own ways. I think the internal tearing from the septum um, and then my baby being so big, he was, like I said, nine pounds, 14 ounces, but he had pooped before they weighed him. So I'm convinced he was 10 pounds and he was 20 two inches long. So I think just the combination of all that made my recovery really hard. I think, uh, I mean the first, I'm only six weeks out now, but the first, I would say two weeks were absolutely the hardest. And I maybe a week or two ago, I'm just now starting to like sit normally on my butt without severe pain or having to lay on my left side. I had a ice pack strapped to my vagina, like all day and night. And, you know, then you have the peri care where you have the peri bottle and the dermaplast and the witch hazel and the pads, and you're just like bleeding everywhere. And every time you pee, it's just really sensitive because there's tearing. I don't know. It just, it just was really difficult in its own way, but I'm kind of glad in a weird way to have experienced both. Yeah, it's a lot to manage as far as recovery. Yeah, and it's crazy because I've heard so many women on this podcast say, like, my biggest goal was to not tear. And I was like, man, everybody puts so much emphasis on tearing. I feel like everybody just tears and, like, it's just what happens with a vaginal birth. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, now I'm like, no. Like, if I could have not torn, that would be amazing. I mean, yes, you're still sore and you're still painful because you just pushed a baby out, but... I feel like, yeah, you'd be able to pee and like sit a little more normal. And so I think my emphasis on our third baby is like, yeah, I really want to not tear if that's at all possible. Have you gotten any guidance as far as if you do have another like how to another vaginal birth, how to protect your septum and not tear? Well, so he cut the vaginal septum, like the piece of tissue off. Yeah. Okay. So that shouldn't like grow back or anything, hopefully. No. Yeah. Oh my gosh. If it grows back, I'm going to be like, what even is this thing? Um, (laughs) No, that should not be an issue. I think the, that tearing won't be a problem. And honestly, sometimes I'm like, I mean, I had my six week checkup with my OB and he was kind of like, maybe this baby paved the way. And like, since he was so big, you know, your next one will have an easier time coming out. But then I saw, I've been seeing a pelvic floor therapist, which has been amazing, by the way. I think everybody should see one. Mm -hmm. But she was just saying like, I don't know how nobody knew that you had a septum, but this could potentially make it easier for your next delivery. But also like, we're still going to have to work on a lot of things because you have so much scar tissue and just a lot of damage done. And so like you need to be doing like perineal massage before your next, you know, delivery. And she kind of gave me some tips and she's been really helpful. And not that my OB isn't helpful, but I feel like they have their limits on kind of what they can do for you or will do for you. Whereas she specializes in pelvic floors and she's just like all about it. And she's like, no, this is what a healthy pelvic floor is like here's how you get there. We're going to work on this. So I'm going to be seeing her. Yeah. And I just, am like, wow, I don't know what I would do without you because I'm just randomly peeing my pants and yeah, that's not what we want. (laughs) Yeah. So she's, she's been really, really great. Good. Good. All right. Well, any resources you want to add here at the end? So, I mean, obviously I already have said how much this podcast has been a resource for me. Um, 
but definitely this podcast and then in general listening to people's birth stories and asking about them was so, so helpful. And I know not everybody's into that. Not everyone really wants to like talk about birth stories. Yeah. I'm kind of a birth junkie. So I feel like I'm like, yeah, just ask anybody on the side of the road. And people are like, uh, (laughs) that's weird. (laughs) But talking about it, listening to it was so helpful. Just everybody's is different. Like it doesn't matter who you are, what you go through. Everybody's is always different. And every story I've ever listened to Even the ones on this podcast that are like slightly traumatic or end up, you know, sad or um, kind of scary, like I always listen to them because they always teach me so much about birth. And so, Mm -hmm. and that's not for everyone, but that, that was really helpful. And then I read through part of the book, Expecting Better, I think by Emily Oster. Mm -hmm. I didn't read it like front to back. I kind of skipped through and read like the parts that I felt were more pertinent to me. But I felt like that was helpful. I wish I had more time to read more books because there's a million that I've written down from women on this podcast. I'm like, oh, that'd be great. And then I just have a toddler running around and now a newborn. I'm like, I just don't have time. Um, But honestly, just mainly this podcast, like I can't say it enough. It's just been so wonderful for me to get through everything. So... Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. All right. So then what about if people want to reach out to you, where's the best place to do that? Yeah. So like I said, I am a birth, pregnancy, labor junkie, and I love to talk about mom stuff and nothing is TMI for me. Like (laughs) I'm not weirded out because I'm a nurse, so I don't care what you have to say, but um, you can find me on Facebook. It's just Hannah Wildhaber and you can also find me on Instagram. I think I'm Hannah underscore Wildhaber which is kind of a weird last name, but if it's in the show notes, people can see how to spell it. But yeah, I'm, I'm active on both, more active on Instagram, but I'm active on both. And you could email me at harder.hannah at gmail.com, which I can, I think you have my email, but it's just H-A-R-D-E-R dot Hannah at gmail.com. But I would say Instagram is probably the best place. Okay, great. Well, yeah, we'll put all those on the show notes page. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing and yes. coming back to give us the the sequel. Oh, yes. Thank you for having me. It's been great. Thank you so much again to Hannah for sharing her story with us. Remember, you can listen to her first birth story on episode 524 via our archives. We have over 500 episodes there on Patreon that are not in your main podcast feed, and you can access those by heading over to patreon.com slash birth hour and pledging your support. And thank you, of course, to 8 Sheep Organics for sponsoring this episode. Don't forget, you can use the coupon code BIRTHHOUR to save 10% off at 8sheep.com and check out all their amazing products, my favorites being the Sleepy Lotion and the Belly Balm. If you want more information from today's episode, head over to thebirthhour.com and search for Hannah's name in the search bar to find her show notes page. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click Become a Member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.